are listening to the Sunday service at the International Evangelical Church in Finland. For more audio and visual content, visit our website at church.fi. All who thirst come to the waters, leave your barren land. Forget the past and look ahead. I will praise Him. Exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise His name. He is the Lord, forever His truth shall reign. Heaven and earth rejoice in His holy name. He's exalted, the King is exalted on high. He's exalted, the King of exalted. He's exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He's exalted forever, exalted and I. Welcome again to church. We're celebrating Pentecost Sunday today, the, the outpouring of the Spirit. And we do that every year, like many other things in church. And some things we do every week and some things we do daily. But I want to encourage you to be expectant. The Apostle Paul, when he was traveling through the Mediterranean, there's one place where Luke, who wrote the Acts of the Apostles, tells us that Paul was speeding up everything he wanted to do because on Pentecost Sunday he wanted to be in Jerusalem. And that's a couple of years after that Pentecost Sunday that we are talking today about. But Paul again wanted to be there because again he was expecting God would do something. So be expectant today. What happens in Paul's life, however, is that soon after he arrives in Jerusalem, he is actually thrown into prison. And restarts today our relationship with Jesus. I don't know how your week was. Maybe chaotic, maybe hectic, maybe you had all things on your mind. But that's the beauty. His grace is new every morning and every week when we come together. It's a good moment to restart. A great opportunity. Father, we thank you again that you're present among us and we invite you to come. Send your spirit. Speak to us. Minister to us. As we sing your praises in your name. Paper Bible in your phone, whatever you brought today. I would like to talk simply about why you and I, we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Pentecost, and we will soon learn more about that, is all about the outpouring of the Spirit. But the question is never what only happened in the past, but what can happen today. The question is not even in our personal lives, have we been filled at some point, have we become Christians at some point, but what is happening today? Are we open to receive from God? And I want to talk to you about why, yes, we can be filled, we can receive the Holy Spirit, even today, even now, as we're gathered. But why don't you turn to your Bible with me and let us together read first that account of that Pentecost that is the reason why we are all here today. 
On that day, it was 120 people. That was all the church was about, the size of the early church. Then Pentecost happens, and we're here as a result of that. We read in Acts that when the day of Pentecost came, there was an ancient feast that was celebrated for centuries. When that day came, they came, they, that is the early Christians, were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. That is, all the known world from the people who are there in Jerusalem. And when they heard the sound, a crowd, crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? That's backwater, uh, flyover people, uh, countryside people. They open their mouth and you don't expect them to speak in another language. It's these people, but they speak the languages of the people present. How is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene. What does that mean? Holy Spirit, what do you want to do? Would you speak to us through these words, to us as a church, but also to us personally, individually? Speak to us about who you are and what you want to do. Amen. I thought to make it very simple, I ask five questions and think of some answers. And they all have to do with the Holy Spirit in Pentecost. Maybe all of them are questions for you. Maybe just one of them. And lean in and see what it is for you that speaks to you today. Um, what is Pentecost? It's interesting, in verse 1 it said, when the day of Pentecost came. So that was not the first Pentecost. No, in fact, this feast had been celebrated centuries upon centuries upon centuries among the Jewish people. 50 days, that is what Pentecost means, 50 days after Passover, there's the feast of the first fruits. Um, but there was always an expectation, as always when God's people come together, that God would be doing something. Now as we look back at that day as Christians, Pentecost, that Pentecost that Luke writes about, concludes actually the whole salvation history, everything that Jesus did. On Christmas, Jesus was born. He became one of us to live among us. Then on Good Friday, he died for us, for my and your sins and the sins of the whole world. On Easter Sunday, he rose, as Paul says, as the first among us. Then on Ascension Day, he rises to sit at the right hand of the Father to rule and reign and be with us forever. And on Pentecost, he sends his Spirit to live in us, dwell in us, work in us, and help us carry out what he wants us to do here in this world. So that's Pentecost, in a nutshell. So who is the Holy Spirit? They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Who really is? the Holy Spirit. Luke tells us in Acts that Paul in one occasion, on one occasion he was running into disciples who were Jesus followers, but they never had heard about the Holy Spirit. So they had picked up bits and pieces, but they did not know about the Holy, Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? What would you say? Who is he? It's interesting, in the Hebrew, the word for spirit and it was quite violent. It's when you bike and then you have in your ears that loud sound of the wind. The wind is the reason why you have storms on the sea, on the ocean. To the wind, there's that idea that wind is what it means to be filled and receive the Spirit. 
And if you go to your Bible, if you would go from the beginning to the end, at the very beginning, as God created the heaven and the earth, it says that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So at the very beginning, in creation, God's Spirit is involved. But then when God creates man, it says God breathed his Spirit into man, and man became a living being. A body without spirit, without breath, is a corpse. But God breathes in us, and so we become living beings. But then, fast forward, Jesus comes, Good Friday, dies on the cross, rises from the death uh, on, on Easter Sunday, and Paul says, Jesus, who the Holy Spirit is, the creator spirit who is there at the beginning, who brings order into chaos, but also the spirit who gives life, who renews, who revives, who sets free, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The Holy Spirit is also a person. And He's one with the Father and the Spirit. Do you know the Holy Spirit as a person? It's not like Star Wars, just a force. The Holy Spirit is a person. So what does He do? What does the Holy Spirit do? It's interesting that everything that happens to the church, that happens to us, Jesus gives us the model. We we learn in the Gospels, and you could pick the Gospel of Luke, that Jesus at the very beginning of his ministry, he allows himself to be baptized. Now people often wonder, why did Jesus need to be baptized? He didn't. Baptism is a sign of repentance. Baptism is a sign of sins forgiven. Jesus didn't need that, but he is baptized to signal to us, to tell us that I'm living for you. I'm one with you. I'm representing you. I'm taking on me all your burdens, all your sin, and I'm willing to go to the cross. Jesus identifies with us. So everything that happens to him happens to us. And then when Jesus steps out of the John River, we're told that the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form as, and it appeared to be like a dove, like that's the way to describe it. It's language of analogy. We don't know what it looked like, but that's what the gospel writers tell us. But then the next thing that happens, and Luke is the one who highlights that most, after his baptism, after after his baptism, Jesus does everything he does in the power of the Spirit led by the Spirit, anointed by the Spirit, full of the Spirit. So that's what the Holy Spirit did in Jesus' life, and Jesus is the example for us. But here, if you look at that first Pentecost, there's two things that um, the Holy Spirit does talking to you about the Spirit that I will send from the Father. So that's happening on Pentecost. But then we have three signs externally what the Spirit is doing, and then we have three clues in terms of what that means internally. And that happened on that day, but it also applies to us. What are the external signs? There is, you've heard it, wind, there's fire, and there's tongues. Wind, no, that's, again, he burns away in us everything that doesn't look like Jesus. Everything that is not of God. That is the purifying work of the Holy Spirit. And the image often used for that is fire. But then also fire is a symbol for passion. The Spirit sets the church on fire. And we see them walking away full of passion, full of seal, full of desire to make Jesus known. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And then there's tongues. And it says the Holy Spirit enabled them. He's a giver of gifts, and in that case, he gives the gift of tongues. Um, There is, when that gift is given, and some of you speak in tongues, you know that, but those who don't, who maybe have never heard it, can sound like angelic tongues that we don't understand. But then it can also sound like human tongues that actually somebody else might understand. And it can happen in a way that a person that never has learned a language, all of a sudden, speaks that language not necessarily understanding themselves, but to minister to someone. Um, some of my kids, they got a new Swedish teacher. And uh, we had many debates around the table about Swedish. 
and how my kids would have loved to receive the gift of speaking Swedish right away. The Holy Spirit anointed inside out, they're purified. Then he tells us that the Spirit rests on them, and that's what we are called as Jesus follows. That's the promise that the Spirit rests on us. Not as in the Holy Testament, but Old Testament, that the Spirit comes and then he goes, but he rests on us to remain on us. And then he is enabling us, in this case, to speak tongues, but then there's other things. But why would we need the Holy Spirit? You know, you could be sitting here and thinking, you know, all nice, all interesting, or not so interesting. Why, why would I need the Holy Spirit? Maybe you walked into the store and you think, I thought, you know, uh -huh, I should have gone to the beach. It's such a beautiful day. Um, why do I need the Holy Spirit? Everything is okay in my life. Why do I need the Holy Spirit? Three things why you and I need the Holy Spirit. Always, and again and again. The first thing, it's the Holy Spirit who helps us understand and fills us with God's love. Paul says in Romans 5, God has poured his spirit into, his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And, and what Paul talks about and what that means is to understand that God is love, not just in a way of reading somewhere that somebody writes about the doctrine of the Christians, they believe that God is love, but understanding in your inner being that you are loved. Do you know that? As you're sitting here, do you know that you are absolutely loved by God? And does that do something with you? Is it just a cold fact? Or are you living actually in a way that this is moving your heart again and again? That's what the Holy Spirit does. And if, if you're sitting here and you think, like, I don't have that experience. I don't, I'm not even sure does God love me. How can God love me? Or yes, I know that God is lo loving me. That's what the Bible says. But honestly, I've never experienced that. I don't even have a concept for love. You need the Holy Spirit. But then we also need the Holy Spirit again and again and again because, sorry to tell you, we are leaking we're leaking. We are not perfect. Paul tells us that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit is given to every Christian, but we can grieve him. When we are not seeking him, when we are not seeking time with Jesus, we're grieving the Holy Spirit. When we're living our lives in a way that are not in step with who Jesus is, we're grieving the Holy Spirit, and he withdraws. We're not able to hear him. So that's why we need to be filled with the Spirit. But then also, we absolutely need the Spirit to carry out Jesus' mission. It's one of my, I don't want to say favorite verses, but one of the verses that means most to me personally, Matthew 28, Jesus commissioning his church, go into all the world, make a Disciples of all the nations. But you know, we cannot do that, not a bit of that, without the Holy Spirit. First, Jesus gives his mission, and then he sends the Holy Spirit to carry it out. You need the Holy Spirit. And maybe, to put it the other way around, if you're still sitting here and you're saying, I'm not sure, can I tell you, if you're married... Your spouse needs you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Your children need you to be filled with the Holy Spirit as a parent. If you're going to work tomorrow, God loves every single of the workers in your workplace, whether it's five, whether it's 50, whether it's 500. He wants every one of them to hear and learn about his love. If you're the only person working there who is a Christian, who is his tool? You. Your workers, your co-workers, need you to be filled with the Spirit. Because the Spirit is the one who enables us to talk about Jesus, to make Him great. That is what He loves to do. To share Jesus freely and boldly. Some of you might think, I, I really, that's really not my thing to ever talk about faith. I'm, I don't have the right words and I feel intimidated, and, and even any conversation about faith, actually, I don't want anyone to talk with me when I go to work. <laughs> they might speak Finnish, and I don't want that. So I'd rather sit alone. You, you need the Holy Spirit. 
Because when the Holy Spirit comes, all these things, these fears that we have, they're disappearing. And we are free to follow his lead. If you're into sports and if you're, um, uh, how do I put it, either as old as I am or you have been watching a lot of YouTube, um, 1992 Olympics in Barcelona. I remember it because I was into running and you know, there were all the 100 meters, 400 meters. I love to see those. Those were the only things that I was actually interested in. There was one guy, uh, Derek Redmond, who is one of the favorites to win the gold medal. But then in the final of the 400 meter, after the start, after his first steps, I think it was his Achilles that tore. And he couldn't continue. He actually he tried to walk, but he couldn't even walk. And then, you know, cameras were, you know, not sure like where to focus on the rest of the race or on the guy who had fallen. But then somebody jumped over the fence and all the security guys and the helpers tried to stop him and said, hey, you cannot, you cannot go here. And he said, of course I can. I'm his father. And those pictures went around the world. Derek Redmond's father coming to him, lifting him up and walking with him to the finishing line so that his son could finish the race, so that he could finish the mission. Do you know that Jesus is more passionate for you to carry out the mission he has for your life than you ever will be? Even if you're sitting today here and you think, I really don't care that much. Jesus cares. And he is passionate for you to do everything that he wants you to do. And the one through whom he does it is the Holy Spirit. He comes along and he helps us to do things that we cannot do without him. But with him in our lives, we're able to do immeasurably more than we ever can ask or imagine. There's two general, uh, reservations and hesitations that people often have about the Holy Spirit. One is that they've been hurt and one is that they're afraid. Hurt because maybe you've been in a church context where Christians have been very insensitive in how they use the gifts of the Spirit or maybe pressured people to receive the gift of tongues or do things that they didn't want to do. Maybe abuse, even manipulate people. And if that is you, you, you might be thinking, you know, once I had a bad experience, I never want to hear anything about this again. If anyone has hurt you, I'm so sorry, but it was not the Holy Spirit. It was not the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is like Jesus, and Jesus is gentle. Maybe you're not hurt, but you're afraid. You know, these bystanders, they say these guys seem to be drunk, which suggests from the bystanders' perspective, these guys are behaving a little bit out of control, uh, a little bit weird. And, and maybe you're a bit like me. I never want to be the weird guy. I, I never want to be the one who, you know, people realize. I always want to sit in the very end. So I'm, when I go to a church, I sit to the very back. I'm telling you as a pastor never to sit in the back, but that's what I love to do when I go elsewhere. Maybe you're afraid. I remember many years ago, 20 years ago, 25, 30 years ago, <laughs> getting old. I was in a place where um, you know, there was a Christian gathering and in one corner people started to sing in tongues, which was utterly beautiful, if you've ever heard it. It's the most beautiful sound that I've ever heard in my life. And at the same time, I was sitting on the other side and because I never had heard it, and it was completely strange to me, I was thinking, I, I, I hope it doesn't happen to me. I, I, I really hope. And I was actually, I was praying, God, please don't let this happen to me. You know, you can also pray silly prayers. God is on a cross with you. But I was afraid, and maybe you are afraid. But Jesus says, God gives only good things. If you ask God for the Holy Spirit, he will never give you something bad, something that hurts you. So, hurt or afraid, don't let this an obstacle. Don't let this be the reason why you're not saying today, I want to receive more. And let's close. Why can you and I, why can we be filled with the Holy Spirit? 
First of all, the Holy Spirit meets us where we are, even in our weakness. I've been often wondering, why did Jesus tell the disciples, don't leave Jerusalem? Do you know why? Why is he telling them that? Why is he telling them not to leave Jerusalem? I was thinking again and again, many times, until I realized Jerusalem is actually where they don't want to be. It's the place of their weakness. Jerusalem is the place where Peter had denied Jesus, where Judas had betrayed Jesus and then taken his life, where all the apostles had been running away and leaving Jesus. Jerusalem is the place where they are sitting behind locked doors, afraid, in fear. They hope nobody comes knocking the door. They're so afraid. They don't want to be in Jerusalem. But maybe even are afraid to walk away so that somebody would see them. So that's why they're behind locked doors. And many of them felt, well, we don't belong here anyway. You know, as the bystanders later say, they come from the countryside. Maybe you as a foreigner, as international living in Finland, maybe that's the feeling you sometimes have. I don't belong here. I don't belong here. This is not the place for me. Well, maybe so. Maybe God is leading you elsewhere. But I think often when we feel like this, there's, there's two ways that we try to compensate that. And especially as internationals. Um, some of us who feel that way, we completely live by our relationships with people that are back in our home country. So people live, they have no contacts here, no relationships here. They're just on Zoom, just on the phone, just on the smartphone, just texting with people far away. They don't belong here, they feel they don't belong, but you know, you try to make it work. Or then we try to tell ourselves by belonging, by completely becoming part of the culture or trying to go for success or trying to go for money. All you need is the Holy Spirit and you will never be afraid and never feel that you don't belong because he's taking our fears away. So it was the place of their weakness and they received the Holy Spirit. So if you feel weak today, if you feel desperate today, if you feel like everything is going against you, that's how many of those felt who received the Holy Spirit on that day. So you can receive the Holy Spirit today as well. Another reason why you can receive the Holy Spirit is because the Spirit is for everyone. Did you notice as I was reading that text how many times it says all of them are filled with the Holy Spirit? All these Jewish communities, actually there's representatives in that list that Luke gives us from every Jewish community around the Mediterranean, around the known world. All of them hear the message. So this is for all. Then it says those tongues of fire, they came on each one of them. So it is also individually for every one of you, for every one of us. Again, the bystanders say we hear them speak in the tongues that we were born into. So God takes our in the you know, 60s, 70s, what do I know, in the US, living on drugs and everything you're not supposed to live to, but then they became Christians. But then because they've been living on drugs, they you know, were not doing so well physically. Actually, Melissa was due a operation. She had developed cancer, and the operation would have meant that all of the organs that she would need to have children would need to be removed. But then the scan shows no issues at all, no cancer, all the traces are gone. Nobody can explain it. And even more amazing, she gets pregnant, which she thought she's not able to do. And then their son, um, not interested in music at all, but then in his 20s, starts to pick up a guitar. And Jonathan David Helser, for those of you who don't know it, he's the one who wrote um, uh, No Slaves, uh, Sing Hallelujah, many worship songs that we actually sing in these services today. So in a place of weakness, God is reaching out to reach everyone. But then, let's remember, God is never reluctant to give his spirit. Jesus says, how much more, if you ask the Father for his Holy Spirit, will he do that? Will he give that? So I'll suggest, let's ask now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray very briefly. And then we have some moment of silence. And I encourage you to ask personal in your heart, Come, Holy Spirit. I welcome you in my life now. And then after a while, we are continuing with worship. And as we worship, there will be people standing to the side as we stand. And if you want, and I encourage you, 
go to someone and they might simply lay hands on you and pray for you. And I want to encourage you, go if you're desperate, but also go if you're not desperate. If you think like, you know, everything is fine. Come. Pray. Expect. Because God is never giving you something that wouldn't be good to you. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that you're so loving, so good, so gentle. And we now invite you to send your spirit. Breathe on us. Fill us. Come, Holy Spirit. But receive the blessing. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you. and keep
Lord, turn His face toward. 